So our next speaker, um, you know, she started, obviously it's a woman, um, uh, and she started out as a cardiologist, a, essentially a heart failure cardiologist, and now she's running Lennox. I mean, one, of, one of the unfortunate things about Lennox is that we're remote from the medical school a little bit geographically. And so this is our, 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 our big swing to get to meet you guys because it's, you know, it's so much easier to go to North Shore and it's appropriate, it's, it's closer, it's, it's the key hospital in our health system. Um, and Jill actually spent time at, uh, at, at Mount Sinai first and then um, came to the health system, was at LIJ, Long Island Jewish Hospital, before she came to North Shore as the chief medical officer and then became the, the president of our hospital about uh, three years ago. So I think her trajectory both as a from medical school, as a woman in cardiology, and then uh, moving on to a leadership position in a large health system, I think is unique. Um, and she'll hopefully speak to some of those things. I think for the audience, uh, you know, the, I think she's just a terrific person and uh, I'll introduce her when she gets on. But Sabrina, Maria, Marianne, if you wanna stay on with us, if you have time, um, that'd be great. Um, and uh, as far as uh, the additional just points of information while we have time is we are gonna submit uh, Randy is going to send out uh, in SurveyMonkey by Monday a survey that y'all have to fill out. And so with that, if you don't fill out the SurveyMonkey, we can't give you credit for the, the internship. We, have your, we do have your, um, your, the attendance records, but even if the attendance records are important, but what's most important is that you get us these, uh, these, these surveys back. Because what we'll, we, I know a lot of you have put on brain internship on your um, on your LinkedIn's, which is super exciting for us to see our logo all over LinkedIn. But if if if, if uh, we get pinged by you know a college, a university, or a medical school, like that these people actually do this, you have to fill out the the, the survey so we can keep track of who did this. And we, we were going to give you a, a certificate once we get the survey back, so you'll have a certificate because this is the real thing. You spent a lot of time and effort on this, and you deserve to have credit for it. We, this is our way of getting a small piece of information back. So that survey monkey will be released on Monday. And then we're gonna write a paper about our experience. It's gonna include the School of Medicine, Sabrina and Marianne, you're gonna be co-authors, uh, whether you want to or not. And um, uh, I think I have to thank Randy, Josh, and the team for um, you know, all the creativity and support. So uh, Randy, we'll, we'll, we'll fill in the, the, the interns a little bit more, I guess, Monday. Monday, yeah, the, the survey will go live next week, so. Great. So with that, um, it's 10.06. We've already cut into six minutes of Jill's time. I, this is Dr. Jill Kalman. Uh, Jill is currently the president of Lenox Hill Hospital and a uh, close colleague and, and friend. Uh, she, uh, the reason why I think, you know, we have two more of these chairman corners left and Jill is, um, was kind enough to offer to do this one. She started out as a cardiologist and a heart failure cardiologist when the Sinai system moved on to LIJ, Long Island Jewish Hospital. And then I met her for the first time and she became chief medical officer, uh, which uh, a chief medical officer, I'll ask her to describe what you do at Lenox Hill rather than me telling what a chief medical officer does. But then she chose this, this route of sort of a medical administrator who's an MD. This is, a, I think, a really one of the great things about healthcare right now is that doctors are beginning to take on leadership positions on the administrative side. And the reason I think Jill is such a unique person is that she's one of those doctors. In addition to that, there's nothing better than watching Jill, uh, who's the only woman in the room, run a chairman meeting with about 30 men, and she's in charge. And so I think that she really represents, I think, the future of, of healthcare and a future of women in healthcare. And I just will start off by introducing her and asking her, maybe you just describe, Jill, um, what, you know, where you trained, how your, your trans, your, each of your transitions, what your thinking was, I might cut you off and just ask you a quick question, but I'm gonna let you take the floor and go from there. We have right now over almost 1400 uh, students on board with us. And um, I think seeing a women leadership is really critical to brain turnship. And I'm um, so glad that you could join us today. Well, thank you very much. And David, thank you for that um, lovely introduction. And I agree, we are colleagues and friends. And this is why I'm really honored to be a part of this incredibly successful internship during a really very peculiar time in all of our lives. So thank you. Um, yeah, it's been an interesting ride. I'll tell you that much. Um, I don't think I could have predicted that this is where 
I would have been given what I wanted to do, but I had known I wanted to be a doctor going into college. And I went to the University of Pennsylvania and, and I was going in, there was a, a major then called the Biological Basis of Behavior, called BBB. And it was one of those hybrids between psychology and biology. And then I had a uh, personal crisis in the middle of college. It's like, I mean, did I really want to be a doctor? And I, you know, I had so many other interests. I have interests in art and culture and ballet and, and I just, and, and history. And I just felt very stifled by only studying science in college. And it really kind of threw me off course about wanting to be a doctor at first. And so I ended up majoring in European and art history, which I didn't do as well in those courses as I did in the life science courses but it completely ended up fulfilling my need of a broader education and then got me back on track to what I really wanted to do was to very much be a doctor. And I'd wanted to be a doctor for so many years. So that uh, did get me on track. And then from, and then, you know, at Penn, I uh, was actually recruited to run track at Penn. Um, I'm a, or I was a sprinter. I, I really have to use the word was. And um, I, had broken my wrist actually initially when I first got to Penn. And so I ended up being derailed and not being able to run track, which is interesting, which was, it made me really be able to actually do a lot of research during my college years and those type of, that type of work. And then I went on to uh, Mount Sinai Medical School. And uh, really, I, I mean, I found it very stressful, but I loved medical school. I loved everything about it. And I really was, you know, I really knew I was in the right place. And then when it came to clinical, I also, I, loved many, many things. Um, I really thought I wanted to be a surgeon. I adored general surgery. And I just made a decision at that point. Of, um, and this I think comes into being a woman in healthcare and a lot of demands because I think it is different. I just felt that I was unclear on the surgical route. I, um, how, how I would manage family and children and work if I was a surgeon, because there is different responsibilities. So I went into internal medicine and I chose cardiology, which is not any less demanding to tell you the truth. Um, but I, in medicine also like many, many different specialties, but then, but then, then did find a passion for cardiology. And I also found a research mentor um, my second year of residency, Milton Packer, who was one of the foremost heart failure physicians in the country, if not the world at the time. And he, you know, I, there's one of my favorite co quotes uh, called chance favors the prepared mind uh, because and it's a quote by Louis Pasteur because I think it's really so and I think it has really led to a lot of my successes through my career that if your mind is open to really succeed and you don't put those into categories and the things that you pass in a day may lead to your success. So many, many, when I was a second year resident, there were many of us who wanted to be cardiologists and I wanted to stay in New York and it was wildly competitive. And so everybody goes to Milton Packer and a handful of others to do research. And he um, kind of, you know, at the time, um, his, he had this huge database of heart failure patients and it was on, I'm sorry to say, it was on paper. So we'd hand you this database and to anybody who wanted to do research, and he would give it to you for a weekend and you have to comb through it and see if there was anything that you wanted to study. And I spent all week and do it. And, and I was clearly like, certainly I'm a failure. I have nothing I want to study. This is not for me. And I was made an appointment with him on that Monday for 4 p.m. to say, I'm just, I'm not going to do research with you. And I passed him in the hallway at 1 p.m. And he goes, do you want to join me uh, with a me for a meeting at one o'clock looking at, at three o'clock looking at um, immunology and heart failure? And I said, I would love to. And so I never made it to the four o'clock to tell them I wouldn't do research, but I made it to the three o'clock, which really launched my career in immunology and heart failure, which I studied cytokines and its uh, relation to the progression of congestive heart failure and became an incredible body of work that led to the development of therapeutics and clinical trials. That was one of the most exciting points of my career. And so I really then launched into a, uh, first it was a translational you know, laboratory and clinical um, science career, but I really had a very, very robust clinical trials research career in heart failure, mostly at Sinai, but I was also at a couple other institutions. And I really felt that I contributed an enormous amount to the therapeutics that now define how we treat congestive heart failure, which was truly remarkable. And it was an absolutely, you know, wonderful, though very difficult career. 
And then um, I went, went, made a couple of different changes. I was at Sinai for all my training. I stayed four years. After four years of being there, I decided to move on because I had other heart failure directors above me. And I didn't feel they were promoting me in the right way. And I uh, felt they weren't, um, like David just said to the two of you, you know, your names are going to be on this paper, whether you like it or not. No one said that to me. It was really more, you know, they were holding on to the clinical trials. And I felt someone should to me should have said, here's a new clinical trial. You be the principal investigator. And no one did. And they were- Did you think, too, that, was part, did you think that was partly because you were a woman at that time? When was this from like the 90s? When was this? Like Yeah, 90s. Late 90s. Uh, late 90s. And, yeah. you know, it could have been. I never, you know- Interestingly, I never saw it that way. I maybe should have. I saw it more that they were still very much mid-career and it was very competitive and they wanted those trials associated with their name, which is really not how we should be doing it. It's really about once you have those trials associated with your name, it's like, you know, then you know, give it up and let people run. So I left and I went downtown to Beth Israel to, to they didn't have a heart failure program. And I started and directed my own heart failure program, which was also incredibly gratifying because then all the trials were mine and I got to develop my own fellows and people who worked with me. And it was absolutely wonderful. Um, and then after a while, I took spent seven or eight years there. I wanted to kind of get back into some of the bigger institutions in New York. And I chose to be at NYU for a, a year and a half. And interestingly, went ran into a very difficult political um, mess when I got there. So I was only there for a year and a half and I left and went back to Sinai. It was the only time I really got, well, that's not, not my only time, we all get in. David and I have these conversations and political messes happen, ups and downs in our career and mostly are ups, but they do happen. And I think it's how you navigate them. And um, I decided to go back to Sinai and um, I went to Sinai and that was in 2007 and I spent the next seven years there. And somewhere in the middle of that, I started thinking about that I wanted to do something else other than just purely clinical. I adored heart failure. It's an heart failure transplant is incredibly gratifying. Patients are incredibly sick. There are life and death decisions. There are, there's everything because there's life and death. There's chronic, there's, you, you, there's research. It's so robust. But at some point I was feeling the need to do something else and healthcare was changing dramatically. And this is when Obama came in and was changing our, the, the Affordable Care Act. And I, and I said, you know, I could either continue to fight this or I can join this mess and, and, and see what it's like to kind of join healthcare delivery. And at Sinai, I started developing a portfolio of really what would be considered quality projects in the world of quality. And then really started enjoying them and got very involved in readmissions and uh, healthcare delivery, and then decided I wanted to kind of go that full route of administrative because I felt it, at the time I felt I personally might be able to make more of an impact in healthcare delivery given what was happening in the country than my heart failure career. And it was a very hard uh, decision to leave clinical medicine. And I would, not that I, I still keep a practice, but I would like walk in the CCU and I would, kind of, and I don't mean to be dramatic, but I would say, I, I would say to myself, and I would look at the patients and I would say to myself, can I give up that feeling of saving a life? And it was a very, that's how I kind of broke it down. And it took me two years to kind of say, because there's something, it's very, when you're in clinical medicine, there's nothing more gratifying than getting patients through a journey. And sometimes that journey is saving a life, but sometimes that journey is helping people to end of life. But it's, it's so fulfilling that to leave that was actually a very difficult decision, but I did feel I needed something more fulfilling or just something different. So I did go fully administrative. And when I looked around at health systems, it was called North Shore LIJ at the time, but Northwell was just, it was a different place than the other health systems in New York City. And so I decided that's where I wanted to go. And I started talking to people and they really felt I could be in the chief medical officer track. So they um, brought me in to LIJ first because the center of the health system is Long Island. And um, they said, you want you to learn North Shore and LIJ first? And I did, and then you'll probably go to Lenox Hill. Tell and, me about, can you tell the group here what a chief medical officer does? Yeah, so it's actually, it, it's not nebulous, but they're, they're really responsible for the quality and the physicians in the hospital. 
so the the chief medical officer, I said, you know, there are kind of two buckets, how quality and, and care is delivered, then taking care of the physicians, so the direct line to the, to the chairs, as David is, and then all the physicians and how you care for them and how you create programs around them. And then I always say, and then the other categories and then anything else you want to do, which kind of makes it an exciting job. So if you know, and that's what was exciting because I was at LIJ. And then when I came to Lenox Hill, it was still kind of a mess. I mean, it was, I came here and they had, uh, Lenox was this historic hospital, but yet had fallen in both quality and reputation. And Northwell took over in 2010. I got here in 2015 as the chief medical officer. And at least it got to a point like the, the, the hard work had been done. Like they really got financially level and quality level, but we, we still was quality, not where it should be. And so what my job was to get the quality stabilized and make it a place where doctors and patients wanted to come. And that's what a chief medical officer does. And then the anything else is you can look around, which is kind of what makes the job really exciting and say, what do I personally think the strategy in the hospital should be to make this a place a better place for patients and physicians? And is that building up a neurosurgical program? Is it building up the pediatric surgical program? And if you love medicine like I do, it's kind of a, a wild job because I was charged with looking what a pediatric intermediate care unit is. I, it's so fun because if you love medicine, you're like, well, I, I'm not a pediatrician and I'm not an intensivist, but let me figure out what, what that is. And so it's very broad stroked. And I was the chief medical officer and we had, for three years and we had a lot of successes uh, during those years. We really started to gain traction in both the quality and physicians wanting to come here and program development. And um, we were doing very, very well. And then my, the executive director or CEO of the hospital, who's uh, Dennis says to me, you know, if I retire and he was thinking of retiring, would you consider this position? And I had never thought about it. I thought I'd be in that chief medical officer job for a while. And then I would kind of, you know, not sure where that I wouldn't do anything else. And then I was like, wow, that would be exciting. And having been in New York City medicine my whole life and being asked to be the CEO of a hospital was really something. And so that was a journey to get there. They had me go to Harvard Business School to take an executive uh, business class class <laughs> course, which I'm not sure, you know, it's not like you can learn this business side, but I started this now two and a half years ago. And um it's been really an interesting journey. So, um, you know, we've, um, Sabrina, I'm, I'm going to ask you to ask a question in a second, but I just to give you time to think what you might want to ask Jill, because I didn't tell you you're going to ask, and Marianne too. So I'll turn it over to you guys shortly. But the last thing I want to ask, um, unless I'm needed to come back in again, is with Lennox Hill, we, you know, um, the show, there was a lot of attention to the fact that there were no women in our department. Uh, we've, we've had some, uh, you know, and we've actually recruited women into Staten Island, and there are actually two uh, women neurosurgeons at North Shore. We've yet to bring a, a full-time a, a woman into Lenox Hill itself. But the other thing was this importance of our fathers, the male kind of dad to son. You know, this you know, in Hollywood, there are all these stories of like in Star Wars or, you know, this kind of like father-son thing really runs consistent through our culture. And even in, in the show, you know, John and our father, our relationship with our dads had a lot to do with our, our experience. But as a man, that's easy to pull. That's, that's one thing. I know that you had a really close relationship with your mother. Yeah. And, um, I guess the question is, you know, how did that relationship impact you? And, and was that the, you know, the, the mother-daughter thing isn't as focused on sometimes for, you know, but I think that that's another way of beginning to encourage the, the strength of women and getting women into in the medicine is that that's just as important, not that you, or your father too. I mean, your, your father may have, have had a, a similar or a different influence as well. So, but I do know about your, your relationship with your mom. And uh, we don't talk about that, like moms and daughters relationships in, in as, as easily or as doesn't just whatever, whatever reason our culture. So I thought this would be a good time for you to, you know, talk about that. Cause I know just in talking to you, how, how important, even the whole ballet thing and the fashion, we all know where that came from. So yeah. yet how did that affect your career choice? Yeah. And so there you go. And yeah. I'll let the, uh, the women uh, medical students take over. Yeah, no, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. So actually, I have to tell you, it's nothing I've been, it's nothing I've been asked before, interestingly. You know, in leadership type meetings. 
Typical. Typical, right? <laughs> but I would say, you know, yeah, I mean, it's classic, but you know, I would say that, you know, the women talk about the mother-daughter relationship too. And I have um, a daughter and two sons. And I would say the relationship of my mother, you know, very much formed my compassionate approach to healthcare. And um, I think that's really where, what, what that came in. My, my father formed kind of the um, kind of excellence in career. Um, but it really, I think that, and, and, you know, I was talking to, I've had that my, my daughter has a number of friends who I've mentored going to medical school. And one was over the other night and she said, why do you think as a woman you succeeded during COVID? And I said, partially because I always lead with some degree of vulnerability and compassion. And I think that that had a big effect on me in terms of my relationship with my mother. Um, and I think, you know, David, what David is also alluding to is that my mother died about uh, it was two, exactly two years ago. And um, at the, my eulogy really spoke to my love of ballet and culture and the role that that played and what she instilled in that in both in my sister and I. So I think that vulnerability and compassion, and I think that's why David is a great leader. I think that that certainly is instilled in you from your parents and, um, you know, something that was very, very important to me. And I think has helped me kind of continue to be myself in this role as an executive director, which is, it's, it's a rough, it's a rough role. So, but thank <laughs> you. <laughs> And those are what we should comment on those meetings of leading all the chairmen and we're all the only woman because it's a fascinating, it's a, it's a fascinating. Yeah, I always, uh, uh, it's, it's funny because you know, you, you just stop, sometimes stopping observing things is the most important thing you can do. It's, 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 it's just incredible. And I, I'm hoping that changes before I'm done that we see more uh, women chairmen in, in, our, in our midst. It's, 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 yeah. not, it's, it's not an easy problem really to solve. It's not, and I feel responsible, for example, you know, I've had the opportunity to recruit new chairmen here at Lenox, and we haven't been successful in recruiting women. And I think that um, we have to look at it differently, and we have to go out and get women and get um, physicians of diversity and pick them out to take positions, to create that trajectory to get where they want to be. I still think it's complicated for women. I think managing the family no matter what they say, it's really hard. And um, I solo with my own my own wife. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. She made a lot of difficult decisions along the way that yeah led her and, to a place uh, that you know, we've are, had that discussion too. Yeah, it's really difficult. No, and you know, no matter who your partner is and how helpful it, it they're it, they're they're difficult decisions to realize. So, Marianne or Sabrina, do you have any uh, questions you'd like to ask Dr. Coleman? Not to unmute yourself, obviously. Uh, I can go. I mean, so Dr. Langer was talking about how you know you were a woman in such a male-dominated field of sort of sometimes being the only woman in a room full of 30 people. And I think that Sabrina and I have already experienced this and that we're doing research with the neurosurgery department at North Shore. And it often happens where you know we're in grand rounds in the morning and it's often whether it's Sabrina and me or I'm the only woman in the room and it can sometimes feel intimidating in that we're not only the only woman in the room, but we're the only medical student. So we're sort of at the bottom of the totem pole <laughs> on top of being the only woman there. So uh, just having those two layers of uh, being surrounded by people that are superior to you. And then on top of that, uh, being the only woman, uh, how have you dealt with that over the course of your career? Um, if you have, or if you have any advice on not just being a woman, but I think being a minority or just in general, uh, if you have any advice regarding that topic or subject. Yeah, I mean, I think how I approached it, I, I very much so was, I just was going to strive to do the best and work the hardest I could do, regardless of man, woman, diversity, which I think is a little simplistic to tell you the truth. And I think I was, I wouldn't say naive, but I just pushed through what I felt because even cardiology in and of itself was more of a male dominated field. Although a lot of women now, 
and I have wonderful women colleagues in cardiology. So I think that, and I, now when I think back, a lot of my leaders were quite paternalistic to me in ways that may not have been to the best of my advantage. So uh, I think the way to do it is to still work as hard as you can be and do your best you can be and notice that it's there at, from where you sit. Notice that it's there and just know that there might have to be, that there are political uh, waves that you, ha that you have to get through. And that, and that would be so of, 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 of anybody of diversity or minorities. And so my advice is, is to get mentors who will really promote who you are regardless of who you are, but take it, say, I want to hire you and be you and know you're in places that value that. And I think that it's extremely challenging. And now sitting in my position, again, it's about reaching out and creating that. I also am creating that path and, and saying, you know, I choose you, let's do this. I think we can choose people that just look like us all the time. I think that is the, the line. And I think that's the unconscious bias that comes in on all of us. And then the question is for women, and I won't say women only now, but for those who take care of families, how should we look at our career structure differently? And I have a very close colleague, Deborah Ashon, who's in the heart failure field, and we were like neck and neck. She's a little younger than I, uh, three kids, um, heart failure physician also at Columbia when I was at Sinai, and we kind of always fantasized about job sharing and that we knew we could do it. But we, know, we knew also that if you really did that, you wouldn't get to where you wanted to be if you had aspirations. So. It's not that that's the answer, but I think to promote women first, we have to think about that, but I'm gonna broaden that out just to what the, a family looks like, look, looks very differently now, and what do we need to provide support? And then we still have to bring in people who don't look at us into our organizations to make it much more of a diverse place in general. And honestly, I'm just gonna, the other part is that it is difficult. And you know, managing young children and spouses and partners, it is not easy as a woman. And then I was a, um, I was a fellowship cardiology fellowship director at Sinai for a couple of years, and I had many a cardiology fellow women coming to me and, and a lot of crying in my office. And I was happy they did, you know, especially when they were young and they had young children. It was like, it's hard. It was, you know, but like I have three very proud children who are proud of where I am. And, you know, that makes all the difference. So, thank you. I think yeah, that, I well, I'll turn over to Sabrina, but I think that the reason that the reason it's important for us is men have to know what, what, what's going on too. And it, it's not just, it, in order for this to happen, you know, men have to be aware of these, these things and it's, it's, it requires a certain amount of sensitivity. Um, there's a question before I turn over to Sabrina, about um, that someone asked about, do you evaluate women's skills differently? Um, and should, is that, there's a, uh, referring to Jordan Peterson, um, uh, who wrote a lot about, has written a lot about this, about evaluating women's skills differently than men's and whether uh, we say that the requirements are different for men and women, then are we creating quality of outcome instead of opportunity? I think, you know, had, when, when you evaluate a woman leader, I know that you're not looking for someone to be, they have to be at least equivalent. The trouble is in the old days, if a woman was as good as a man, they, the man got the job. And, and so really you have to, they have to be competitive. They have to work hard, but they have to have to be a, given a green light rather than the other way around. Yeah, I, I, I don't. What would you say to that? Yeah, I don't evaluate, but I, the answer to that, I, I say yes. <laughs> I, I don't evaluate women differently than men. I don't think I evaluate, and I will say the think, because you know, there is a part of all of us who do, we don't know where we do, might do things differently. Uh, but I don't believe I evaluate women differently than men. I think what I would say is I try to do is try to put it in everybody's evaluation. I'm not talking about formal evaluations, but understanding who someone is and where they're going and where their, their next level is and who's motivated to go to the next level. Um, I try to put it into the context of personally what might be going on with them because if there are personal challenges and yet they're incredibly talented, should that evaluation be different? And that should you give 
whoever that is, man or woman, a, a different kind of then path to then show what they can accomplish in the setting of what their personal responsibilities are. And, you know, I've said that more broadly, not to bring a lot of things back to COVID, but we're just obviously very in it. When people dove in to kind of do what they need to do during COVID, I would say, don't judge anybody on what they are or aren't doing because you don't know personally what may be going on in their lives. And that's how I try to do evaluate people is that I may know something, but I may not know something. And if I don't know, I want to be as open as I can to understand how they're accomplishing and give them that support. Um, because there's a lot of things that go on in people's lives that make it difficult sometimes for them to function during a day, but yet they are very talented. So um, I would say I don't, and I do want to give, you know, say women and and physicians and clinicians of diversity need to be kind of right now, if we really want to get them to places of success, look at and choose them and put them there and, and, and give everybody the support. But I think if we don't choose and we don't pick, it's not going to happen. Sabrina, you're up. I guess you, you might have spoken a little bit about this, but I feel like given how much medicine and medical school focuses on using your MD to practice and to see patients, like what really convinced you to pursue being a CMO and kind of even with all of the, I guess, barriers that you've talked about against doing that, like what really convinced you that that was where you wanted to take your career? Yeah, such an, I mean, it's, it was a really interesting, and I never would have predicted that starting out to my, starting out my career because I do love patients and I love taking care of patients. And it's become, it's so a part of me. And, you know, David knows this. I, even, I use patient stories in so much of what I do to deliver me messages and to tell a story and to understand healthcare. Um, and it's something that's so a part of me. I think when you are in academic medicine, and I make that distinction rather than private practice, and, I, and I'll explain that in a moment, there are so many opportunities to do so many different things. You could have three different careers, if not more, during the length of your entire career because of the opportunities that are afforded. And because you're basically, when you're in private practice, you're seeing your patients and you're more running a business. You may be part of the mission of the hospital, teaching, research, and all of that, but you have your business. When we are full-time in the faculty of a hospital, it's really our responsibility to add to the running of that hospital. But I always thought that that was an incredibly exciting thing to be. And that meant my day could be when I was in my kind of clinical and clinical research career was clinical, research, teaching. It was so varied. I mean, I just, it could not be a more exciting career, but it's also hard. And then I loved heart failure, but I think I got to a point where, I don't know, something changed in me. It wasn't about the patient, but it was about, I guess, healthcare was also becoming, cl clinical delivery was coming very difficult with the changing with just regulations and everything you had to do. But, you know, I would say heart failure, you make some of the most difficult decisions in healthcare, life and death, end of life. And that's every patient, you know, should they get a transplant? Should they not? Should they get a mechanical device? Should they not? But then when I was, be because of the way it was structured, and I'll get back to that, because I, I think I could have structured differently and that gets back to man, the, the male-female thing in a minute. But I could be seeing 15 patients in the hospital service for heart failure. And no matter what I was talking about and how serious it was, it still I had to make a decision at the end of that patient encounter was how much Lasix to give them, 40 milligrams or 80 milligrams to diurese them. And it was like, I, was, if, I said, if I have to make that decision one more time, I'm going to like, you know, shoot myself. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm being overly dramatic. Meaning it, you know, it just like... So I, I, then that gets back to, I felt that the care delivery models for heart failure should have been different. I was senior in my career. They should be utilizing me to create the, the clinical construct around what a heart failure patient needs, but not dosing license. But yet my partner at the time who ran the program was very male classically and was like, this is how heart failure services ran because I wanted to actually create different types of services, which would actually make people, but people be able to really practice at the top, whether they're mid-level providers, PAs, NPs, who could really do a lot of that. And I just wasn't getting that same satisfaction. And I said, if I'm, I'm lucky, I'm in, 
I'm in an institution. I could go teach at the medical school. I could be a dean of admissions. And so I started investigating kind of those two routes, administrative and, and medical education. And I kind of put both balls up in the air for a while because just because you want to doesn't mean you succeed. So I felt like, let me try to put both in the air. And I also then started more gravitating to the administrative work. Um, and it was just very gratifying. It still is. I mean, I don't, I, there's a lot of stuff that's crazy in a day, but it ain't boredom. And, um, you know, it's, and it never was even clinically. It just was getting the way that the care was being delivered was getting, was over the top. So I would, I would argue that, that some of this has to do with leadership. You know, you, you start to reach a point where there's only yes. so much you can do with, with yep. taking care of patients other than between you and the patient and their family. If you have that bug in you, like to do more, you know, one of the best lines I've ever read, I've talked about this book and I gave the kids a book, the our, our interns a book list. I say kids, they're all young adults called Ego is the Enemy. And there's, there's a paragraph about leadership has to do with giving up some of the things you like to do that, you know, and I'm struggling with that. You know, it's, I love to operate, but if you're going to just focus on operating and not open yourself up to these other things, then you, you miss an opportunity to grow younger people, to have vision to get involved in some of these other silos than healthcare. And I think this is women or man. That's, that's that transition you were making going yes. from, you know, this heart failure Lasix thing to running a hospital. And, and it doesn't happen overnight. It's a gradual withdrawal from these things. Right. It doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, it's such, it's such a good point. And, and I, and I think that was my also impact line. In other words, I felt I was making individual impact on lives and my clinical research was getting to a point where it was more participatory rather than generating my own, which is kind of just where my successes were at the time. So I felt that I was going to contribute more to the overall picture of healthcare by being in a leadership position. So I agree, I agree with that. And it's been, and you know, and to that point of ego is the enemy, David Battinelli, who's the chief medical officer of the whole health system of Northwell. It's truly one of the people who really has, when I came to Northwell, absolutely has supported me on this path through to where I am today. There is no doubt. And he's just someone who has been one of the best physician leaders I've worked on. But he said, um, he says there are three qualities in a chief medical officer. One is street cred. So you have to have been clinically respected to get to a chief medical officer position. So clinical street credibility the ability to lead, you know, just because you want to lead doesn't mean you're able to. And the third is lack of ego. Because what you do as a chief medical officer is really need broadly to promote those, everybody else. Because that's how the patients win and that's how the hospital wins. So, and that was very, you know, I always say, David, he can, in a sentence, like help me define like my life for me. You know, it was like, it was like what he said that he, and he said other, he said, he has said other things like that. And that's what I also mean about getting mentors. You have people and you have to find what works for me. Simple and direct statements work for me. And so when I've had people in my life said, you know, and, and I said, um, another was, I was, there was a woman who was head of the women's faculty group at Sinai. And um, I struggled a little bit during when, when our kids were growing up. And she said, when your youngest goes to college, you will change what you are doing. And she was right. Now it took, it took a while because like changing from clinical to administrative or medical education or research, whatever, you know, it's like navigating a ship. Like you have to build. And, and I think that's something I learned also. It takes patience. You have to build the portfolio to get that experience so that you can change what you do. But I started then and you know, she was right. It was fascinating. So you have to look for those things and what speaks to you maybe it is different for everybody. There are some questions in the chat about your love of art and ballet and how that, how you, how that impacts you now and how you've been able to maintain that. And then it goes from the work life balance. So that'll be one you know, area you can talk about. And the other was, uh, did you experience a shift in behavior with male colleagues toward you as you rose up in the ranks of leadership? Which I think that's a really interesting question. So I'll let you just chew on those two questions for uh, a while. <laughs> 
It's a very so bright group. I'm blown away by the question. Do I have to answer the second one about shift to behavior? <laughs> I think it's actually, yeah. it's actually a fantastic question. So um, the ballet and culture part of my life, which was incredibly significant, is incredibly significant, but it was incredibly significant growing up. It was really the focus of our family from plays and musicals and ballet and movies and, and music in the house. And I think what it did was it gave me a kind of broader understanding of people. So as a physician, it, it just gave you that humanism cultural side of how to look at things. And interestingly, my other role in the health system is that I'm the um, medical director or physician lead for patient experience for the health system, which really means I run the, the um, strategies around um, physician mostly communication. And so now we've created this communication course that is all around humanism and, and communication and empathy, which I think is actually very connected to my importance of culture in my life. And it just is the kind of the um, humanism, um, communication, interaction, relationship side, which I think was very much given to me by my, my mother specifically, um, but also a lot of culture in my life and has just made my life extremely rich. Um, I think that from a work-life balance was it does, it's really what our focus of our family always is and living in New York. It's just, we really take advantage of it um, because of what my daughter does and some of her friends and there's a big music component to that. Um, but it's what our, we have always done. It's actually, I miss quite a bit now with all of that being, being shut down. But um, it, I, I don't know if, it, if it, it's, I don't know if I would call it work-life balance because I will get to that, but it certainly is and absolutely enriches my life and the life of my family and our friends. It's a big focus of kind of what we all do together. Work-life balance, <laughs> it's like I always said, is there one? Um, I don't know if there's work-life balance, but what I, I do know is that my family is the most important thing to me. And I know that the decisions, my, my, my husband and my children, and the decisions I've made in my career, I felt that if I led with what was going to work for myself and my family, I would then succeed at what I did, as opposed to having those things be at odds. And it's very hard and I love a line, you know, the book Lean In, it was like, you know, I'm not leaning in, I want to lean out sometimes. And I, that veterinary parent Penny Bill said that, but I, I do have a work-life balance because I, I, the importance of my family, you know, and friends, it, and I'm just saying, you know, friends are very hard to fit in sometimes because you have family and work and like, you only have a hundred, there's only a hundred percent of your day. So, you know, how do you shift all that? So, but that's the role that culture, and family and, 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 and work-life balance come to me. Shift in behavior, um, as I started ascending the ranks, absolutely. And I do think it may have been male, female. I think I noticed it at Sinai as I was in my last two years there. Um, someone said to me, senior to me, at some point said, you know, not everybody likes you. I said, okay. He goes, I can't remember because I think I was so upset at the time. It was like the people below you like you and the people above you like you. He goes, it's the people at your same level don't always like you. And other two almost being brought to tears, which is, you know, which is a hard thing not to be done. I was, I, I wanted to say, you know, that nobody, not everybody likes you, but it wasn't going to be really be obviously worth it. But I think that was the shift in behavior of a woman succeeding in leadership at that time and getting what I wanted because I pushed very hard to get what I wanted during that time of shifting my career away from clinical. The other was here, came as I started to succeed as the chief medical officer. And then all of a sudden people started to see me as, wow, I might see her as the executive director, meaning the CEO. And I ran into a number of shifts in behavior of um, men mostly that were very challenging. And, um, but there are a lot of men and women who supported me to get to this role, so it did work. But it was, 
not people wanted this job. You know, you know what's interesting is uh, I, I think I'm open to, I I'm, I'm feel like I'm very open to this and trying to be as balanced as possible. One of my most interesting moments just happened recently with, with Ronit Galad, at, who's, at, who's, gonna, who's at Staten Island. And she, it was her meeting. I, I, I sort of set the meeting up. It was really for her to start develop her leadership. And, and in the middle, I just started talking. And after the meeting was over, she called me and she said, Dave, I was really upset. I was like, why? Because you were mansplaining. You know, if you really want me to, to, to do this, then you have to not, you just, it just came across like you were explaining. And I was like, I was, first of all, I was so appreciated that, that, she, that so women have to speak up too, because men don't even realize, I didn't really even realize that I could be perceived that way. And she cut, she basically had the, had the guts right, to, to say, like, say, you know, that wasn't good. And I said, you know what, you're right. And, and it changed our relationship. Yeah. And, and I, I think just, you know, that's something we have to learn to do. All yeah. of us, all of yeah. us on both sides. And, you know, David alluded to a meeting that I, I mean, I have run many meetings where I'm the only woman, but the meeting I think you're referring to mostly is our chairman's dinner, uh, which we have a monthly um, dinner meeting that's all men and I'm the only woman in the room. And I don't technically run it, but I run it with whoever is the president of the medical board. And I once, I, and I always find them, I find that meeting, don't tell too many people this, David, um, extremely stressful. <laughs> And I told Jake Schneiderman this once, and he goes, really? You would never know. And I, you know, I'm in many situations where I am leading the show, but there's something about the intensity of that room that when that is over, I am like, I am fried for the night, but. Oh, martinis. <laughs> that's what the martinis are. But, you know, that's, I learned to get, not comfortable is the wrong word, but at least know that the, anxiety or uneasiness in certain situations is part of what we do and it's okay to feel that and take that and let it drive you to another level or another place turn it back over to the medical students you have any other things you want to ask or talk about i guess to echo some of the questions that are coming from a lot of people um in the chat if i can kind of paraphrase a couple of them together but just i guess what general advice you have for people, um, Marianne and I, in addition to all the people whose backgrounds, unfortunately, I don't know who are watching this, but like what advice do you have going forward in terms of dealing with the other people in your life and how they kind of perceive and help you, or I guess hold you back from doing what it is you want to do? You mean personal people or people at work? Uh, it seems like people want to know about both, so whichever yeah. you'd like to address. Well, you know, I'll start with personal. I think that you know, if you're in a family or in a couple or in a relationship, it's really about navigating that together and making sure you're each supportive of what the other is doing to be able to really succeed. Because I think that is probably the most important thing to um, have you succeed. And that starts with your parents and how they support you. And so to, to be able to express that and discuss that in your personal life and have that. And I said, you know, during COVID, you know, I woke up A in the middle of the night with panic attacks every night, but B every morning to, you know, walk across the park. And I have to tell you, my, you know, my husband walked, our, our kids, thankfully, were all out of New York City. Um, my husband walked me across the park and back and forth every day. And, you know, that, and uh, either you get that support from somebody or from within yourself. And it's about supporting that personal drive. I think from, in terms of work, It's really, I think the advice is finding people who you can be honest with because it is work and you can't be honest with everybody about all the things. And that's unfortunately that, and I don't mean to be this, be a negative. It's just the reality of life as you become more senior in any organization. <laughs> that's why I said David Battinelli, who's the very senior, like he's a man of very few words. And so I think to find people who are like-minded who you can talk things through and get advice from. And you can have go-to people who you can really honestly talk through what your conflicts are. And then people and surround yourself with people who want to build things that are similar to you. And I think to find that and to then recognize when you're not in those scenarios and to get yourselves out of them. 
because you will get to them. That's life. You will get in scenarios and people who don't think the same way you do and are not supportive of what you want to build. And that if you can then find the people who do, you will get there. As I'm looking at Dr. Langer. I was going to say you've made much multiple moves. Yes, yeah. you obviously knew when you were in a good. You knew when you were in the wrong situation. The biggest mistake you can make. That is, is just correct. in there. It's a hang, it's a bad relationship. You know, you, you end up regretting it. You know, you oh, I'll do this until this happens. I'll. It's it's never ending. And I think you obviously proved that you kind of you didn't maybe know what you wanted along the way right away, but you were aware of that you wasn't right in these different situations. And you took it. You you didn't sit there. Yeah, and to be I would say for a year and a half must have been tough. Right. I will, I, will, I will add to that, though, because that's an excellent point. But the question is not to be impatient with it, because you could be wrong yeah. about kind of the nuances of it. So you could be in a situation where that's the case, but don't leave it too quickly, because you should try and navigate it, because there are many lanes within it. And so you might find other paths. And I did actually find, is really where I found my path when I was going through a difficult time, was in taking over this whole kind of new area and quality in the, in the institution I was in, it just happens to have been readmissions. It's not, a, the topic wasn't important, but it was a group of social workers and um, they were the most compassionate and delightful people to work with and I found it. And then I was able to evolve that from a group of five social workers to hundred social workers who were doing a readmission program. And it was probably one of the best experiences of my career. So it's about, and then if it doesn't work, I need to go. <laughs> Marianne, any other uh, questions? Um, I mean, there's a lot of repetitive ones, but I'm seeing a lot of people asking some questions about mentorship and that you talked about that in the first half and sort of people have been asking about sort of what people should look for in a mentor and what you think are good and bad traits of a mentor uh, or just about mentorship in, in general. Yeah, I think that there's kind of the Formal mentorship, we're like, this is your mentor, right? But probably what's more important is the mentorship that evolves. Because if you're put with a mentor and you get a lot of information from that person about you know, advice and questions, but as you develop your work, you're gonna be with people, you're like, I like that. And then it's up to you to kind of Attach yourself to those people, and I really mean it. And if and if they are the kind of mentor that has the qualities of collaboration, of lack of ego, of promoting young people's careers, of giving, of vulnerability, of information, that's who you want to be with. But you have to also, again, it it, it should be like you know there are certain chairmen in our lives, and we talk about, um, like I know in my research it was Milton Packer and Lloyd Mayer, and it just. You know, I started my research and then oh, they, those were, they were my research careers. And then my clinical mentors, you look at people, you're like, it was Jose Meller and Paul Schweitzer in cardiology and Valentin Fuster. But, you know, Paul and Jose, for me at Sinai, during all my, my formative years, I would say, if I could think like those guys, I'm going to be a good cardiologist. I remember one thinking like I made it, you know, and I used to call Jose all the time. I'd have a tough case, no matter where I was, I could be at a different institution. And then, you know, when you, when you had that moment, like that's what Jose would do, you know, that's that give and take. So it's about finding what you think someone who really talks, speaks to you really internally, and then really following that path. And, and I, I sometimes think, even though it's our responsibility as leaders to be the mentor, I think it's also the responsibility to then foster it on those who are training to set, you know, to then kind of be a part of what they do. Because that they, everybody, we, you know, you also want to be with someone who gets out of, gets so much out of mentoring. So I think it's one of the most important things for your career. And don't only do the formal one, find those people who are doing the things you want to do. And that they say, you know what, I may want to look like that as a physician. There's a question, right? And it's incredible. I don't have a mentor. She's from a low, he or she, she is from a low socioeconomic area and um, nobody in her family has gone to college, no docs to visit and lives in a medically underserved community. It's discouraging. Um, you know, I think that this is what this forum's for. So use this opportunity to reach out and um, 
how would, you know, I know Jill's a real, we really encourage that. And I know that you'd be open to, you know, e certainly an email relationship. And then, uh, you know, if you can, I don't, I don't know exactly where in the world you are, but don't let that, don't let the, you got to take, you know, be sometimes work harder in those circumstances, I think. You have to, unfortunately you do, but I'll say, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in for uh, wherever the, the question's coming from, for sure. But the beauty of this is that we're also now accustomed to video conferencing that mentorship should come from anywhere. And that, you know, if someone during this internship you feel has spoken to you, you know, David really has chosen people who actually want to come and speak. And so they want to be mentors. So uh, I would say, reach out to me, reach out to anybody who has spoken here. And I, I am, and I'm sure they will set up a video. These are important relationships for us. Hey, I don't mean to jump in. Hey, Jill, thanks so much for being a part of this. It was Thank you, Randy. fantastic, fantastic uh, contribution. It's really wonderful. You know, we are going to try to. Uh, Thank you. We're trying to do. There was a question about doing a longer webinar. You know, maybe coming up in one of the uh, in some of the other sessions in, in in winter or spring. And I think doing a women in medicine webinar uh, would be, I think, a valuable day um, to make. To, uh, this is a huge topic. It's it's yes. it's almost. It's inconceivable that we haven't that this hasn't really been, happened more often, and I do think we want to make sure that we encourage this. Uh, this is the answer, honestly. I think to healthcare. I mean, we have to. It, it's good for men too. Trust me, and uh, you know we we all need to elevate this to the level it needs to be to, to start getting over this hump. So I, I, we will do that, and um, we'll talk to uh, our medical student leaders and Jill and, and uh, other people so that we do this the right way and get their input and make sure that we don't miss an opportunity. Totally agree. Anyway, thank you all. Really, David, thank you for asking me and Randy and Josh and David. Thank you. And, and thank you to Sabrina and uh, Marion. It was great. Sabrina. Really Thanks. terrific. Thank you. Take care, guys. Happy weekend. Bye. Thank you, everybody.